Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 470th episode of Constructed Chrism. I am your host, Mason. I'm joined by my co-host, Abe Stein. That's me, by the yeah, way. That's you. Yeah, and Spencer is out this week. Has some stuff going on. But we still have a great episode talking about the numbers and deck building. We'll get more to that in a minute, Abe, because we are going to be doing Always Improving This Week. That is the main point of the show. You know, we try to always have that growth mindset, etc. And my Always Improving moment actually comes from this past weekend. So I went up to Caldwell, Ohio. The Apex game people had me uh, as a special guest for their 5K Modern and their 2K Pioneer event. Uh, and I ended up topping both and winning the Pioneer one, which was super fun. But when playing in the finals of the Pioneer one, I had a moment where like there was a lot of conversation and background noise and I was trying to play quick because of time or whatever. And I just sort of like botched a turn and I think it lost me the game because just took six damage when I didn't need to. Game would have been way different. All of these things, you know, would have had a Pelucanus on board. So much would have changed about the game. And if I had just slowed down... And, you know, you know, stop myself from rushing and just ask these people to change the situation or take a minute or whatever. If I had just done this, that would have been good. And this is something that I had learned and sort of, you know, thought to myself like, oh, it's fine. It won't be that big a deal. My hand's great. And I ended up not taking my time. And if you watch those feature matches, I made a really big point of every other round uh, in the tournament to fully think through my entire turn and then execute like I talked about in coaching. And I let it slip up in one of the most important parts of the entire weekend, right? The finals could be up a game in a pretty bad matchup, you know, while I'm on the play, I got to get every advantage I had. Let it slip through my cracks. Ended up winning game two and three, but that's not what matters. What matters is I messed up and sort of didn't do the thing I know how to do. And it was just a good coming back to basics moment and, you know, redoing that lesson. So that's my always improving moment this week. I think that's one that's always super important. And it really shows just like why, I don't know, why the fundamentals like that are so, are so big because you never... Right, you you have to be focused. You have to you have to be honed in on those things. Like I remember watching that finals match and thinking it was like kind of uncharacteristic of you to to like the way you had played that turn that that you feel like you made the mistake on. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's a lot going on, especially after like a long day finals. You literally have played almost as many matches as possible in that tournament series. They really got their their money's worth out of uh, you as a special guest. Yes, I, I played so um, much. If you want to watch me, there's a lot of feature matches. I mean, there's like seven or eight. It's awesome. And you really do have to have to be on top of it. And, and there's nothing wrong with ever saying like, you know, hey, I just need a second or even like, you know, letting a judge know if it's like something distracting around you that like you need to, to reset your space to be able to think because mm-hmm. as a player, you're entitled to that. My was improving moment this week actually a bit of a personal challenge i made to myself as i realized that the magic 30 arena like draft format of just random draftable arena cards was on arena and from there i kind of challenged myself to see you know just like going through playing and drafting a lot of just like clean magic to see if i could get to mythic in just that in limited and really just trying to you know play some really bare bones magic with a lot of unknowns you know, really just honing in on, you know, what are the kinds of things that I would expect my opponent's deck to be doing? What are the kinds of things my deck should be doing? And I really like uh, something I kind of like about these kind of chaos formats is that you kind of get to see a lot of magic in the aggregate and working on things that are not so so they can really get some really like, some really creative opportunities to um, like see interactions with each other and things that do work that or don't work together. How do you evaluate, you know? cards that were good in their draft format but maybe not or maybe are better in in like one that's different and recontextualizing all these cards on this journey to see how how far i could take it was really really fun and also really just felt like a good way to refresh a lot of the the brain muscles on playing magic uh i ultimately last night the format ended i mean as of today 14th it ended like this morning and I was three pips away from Mythic, Mason. Oh, I just no. couldn't bring myself to stay up any later doing one more, but one more draft <laughs> to uh, to get myself there. But considering I started from Bronze 4, having not booted up Arena in like a month, pretty good run. And it felt good to just kind of get back into making magic a part of my routine time. Uh, again, I'm really enjoying it. So That's awesome. No, I, I love that. I, I also love the like, in a lot of ways, it's a lot more how Garfield thought things would really work, right? Like, 
obviously he thought there'd be more curated experiences, but you know, kind of like, Oh, you're sort of playing with what you got, you know, from like all over and they're going to have a way different card than you have. And they might play against something you haven't even seen. And in this case, you've probably seen the card before, especially, you know, with your memory and the amount of limited you play, but it might be like a card you forgot. And you're like, and they got this. It's really cool. And it's, it, I think it is a good way to sort of get sort of the muscles going in and also give you like a cool new way to think and frame the card. So I love that. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash ccmtg. The show will always be free, but one of the perks you get is the Patreon at Shout. So shout out to Andrew for joining the Patreon. In the Patreon Discord, you know, we have a lot of conversation going all the time, Abe. We have, you know, people talking about RC. We have, like, keep mole, hypothetical situations. A lot of trying to figure out what the truth of the matchup is has been, like, a thing I've noticed going on recently, which I really love to see. So a lot of exciting stuff going on there. If you're looking for like-minded people, that might be a place for you to go and grow. Uh, and help us out while you do it. We have no real housekeeping stuff this week. We do have our main topic, though, which is numbers and deck building. And this is a pretty interesting topic that we have sort of brought up. And it is something that isn't really talked about a lot, right, Abe? Like, no one really talks about, like, why do you play a four of versus a two of versus a one of? You know, it feels obvious of, like, I mean, some things, you know, you're going to want four of your best cards. But... It is something that understanding kind of the heuristics about it, especially as we're about to enter, you know, another new set release coming out. It's a new standard format. You know, all these things are going to be new that having that heuristic in your back pocket for just catching out an idea of a deck or or understanding really what the numbers mean. I found that understanding this um, really started to make even just reading like deck list dump articles or uh, or like, you know, going to Gold Station, looking at the league data for many formats made me understand kind of why cards were there better and really changed the way that I um, started thinking about deck construction or sideboarding or tuning decks. And so it's it's really just a good one to go over and make sure you kind of you understand the, the heuristics on because it really does just make, it's kind of, it, these are kind of these rules that everyone plays by in terms of like rules of thumb for deck building and knowing how they work really helps you parse the information you're looking at. I really like that you mentioned like the information you're looking at helps you parse right kind of let you figure out maybe what the deck builder was thinking when they were going over it right even if they maybe didn't have like the active thought they might have had the passive thought and without further ado let's sort of hop right into an abe sort of let's start from the thing that happens the most in deck building four ofs what's going on there four ofs it's the most copies of cards you can play and you do that because it's Right, You just want to have them in your opening hand. You want to draw them. You want to draw multiples of them. These are things like, you know, you always want to have, in modern, like, Ren and Six on turn two. In, you know, a deck like Colossus Hammer, you play all four hammers because you need to find a hammer. It's how your deck works. It's the most important card. You know, even, like, Black, Red, Midrange and Pioneer, you're playing four Fatal Push and four Thoughtseize because they're your best cards to have access to in the early game, and you're never really going to be unhappy to draw multiples of them because they are your best tools. Same with like Fable the Mirror Breaker. It's your most effective card, so you want to draw it. So fours are just like the things that you can't live without. If if your deck needs it or it just works better when you draw it, you start with four because you just want to have most of your best cards. Yeah, what about three ofs? So three ofs can also kind of be a part of like packages of four ofs. I think there's really a couple of ways that three ofs come about. Usually it's like legendary creatures that you might want four of. So a perfect example is right now is you kind of see the varied numbers of Pelucranos and Mono Green. That's a creature that's legendary that you do want to have. You know, it's kind of like your old growth trolls five, six or seven, but you can't really just play four Pelucranos because if you ever draw two of them, the second one's not, not very effective. So um, you're kind of hindered by that limitation. You don't need to draw so many copies of it. Also, cards that you maybe want to see one copy of in a kind of longer game or maybe a mid-sized game. If you have some amount of card selection, you know, like for a long time, uh, is it Murktide would play like three Murktides because it knew that, A, it was not going to be able to really cast four Murktides and want to draw too many and get bogged down with them. But it knew it wanted to see one over the course of a game between its, you know, considers, serum visions, ops, right, all the card selection they have, they really wanted to find a copy of it, maybe two with all their selection, but four was going to be too many. So that's kind of an example of where that can be. Or, I was saying, being part of four ofs, something that happens a lot in, I mean, most mid-range decks. I mean, I know it in San Diego, I was kind of playing, and I spent a lot of time agonizing over my 
my removal suite, I wound up playing like a split of go for the throats and in a braid or two, or like a um, obliterating bolt in addition to the go for the throats I had to kind of split up the package and diversify it a bit. Because even though I only, I didn't want to have so much more removal, you know, like four removal spells at two mana was was kind of the number that made sense for the curve of my deck and, and the frequency with which I wanted to draw them. I wanted there to be a bit of variety. So I was kind of using a three of and I wanted to build that four of, and that's usually when you see threes, threes the most, because you, you have the one that's really your primary, but maybe you get a little bit of added game and, and added utility out of having the one of, and, and you're kind of paying that cost, or it frees up room elsewhere to kind of have a card that's covering, playing two roles in, in a worse way. So, you know, you have three of one half of that, and you're you're kind of forking it on to onto the other card. I love that. What about two ofs? Two ofs are kind of the like this number is one that personally I find that you should really be staying away from unless you have a really good reason to. You kind of can use in the same package idea that I just explained in threes, but typically two ofs are cards that you only want to see like one of in your longer games. It's a card you like want to have access to, but you don't need to have access to it. I think like Croxa in Pioneer Rakdos is kind of a perfect example of this, where it's a card where, you know, you don't ever really need to draw two Croxas, but you do, in a lot of spots, want to find your first. And so having two copies means you'll you'll find one um, with good frequency, and then Croxa specifically right be able to escape it over and over again. You're you kind of there. But comes up you know, if you only had one, it might not come up enough. Yeah, it comes up a lot in decks that have uh, ways to filter cards or find cards, right? When you're able to have something like a lot of blood tokens or Fable the Mirror Breaker, having two of a card means you're more likely to find it in comparison to something like maybe Mono White, which doesn't have much card selection, you know, outside of Recruitment Officer, which is very mana intensive, right? So you might have a hard time finding that individual card, but you still want to have access to something like that in your deck. Yeah, and I think that's like a really, really important distinction to make is that you'll see like two ofs a lot more also in decks where they have really high volumes of card selection. So decks that like, right, like if your deck has Dig Through Time in it, you can get away with way more two ofs and things like that that are even like important two ofs that right matter to kind of sets of your game plans ultimately in some pivotal matchups of yours you're going to see so much of your deck that you're going to have access to them and maybe even in multiple if it's very important. Whereas, you know, in a deck like Mono White, for your example, you're really going to use this something to supplement another group of things. So like, you know, currently with the way Mono White is built, Brave the Elements has fallen to like a two of in a lot of people's builds because between Ossification and Brutal Cathar, the deck's already really good at clearing through the creatures it needs to clear through, so Brave Elements isn't as good. And well, you still want it. You kind of want a lot of those ways to break through, you know, creatures being in your way, because that's Mono White's biggest... Uh, it, it's where Mono White can't afford to lose, right? It can't afford that to be a vulnerability. So it'll play two, but that's really playing, like, copies, you know, seven and eight or nine and ten of effects to, to win in those scenarios, as opposed to... Uh, something else all right that's that's creating a big redundancy by adding two on top of a couple of fours to make that work whereas something like creativity might play like two of a supporting card to, to its game plan and modern um or rhinos might play like two of um its subtleties or you know mis- like having the right tools for the things it's, it's concerned about might use two ofs in different ways and also two ofs can in the same way like i said in the same way that you can use like two pairs of of two ofs to make a four sometimes you can use like a three and a two we saw this in standard for a bit where like people would play shouldered and archfiend of the dross and kind of like flip-flop the numbers because it just felt like you kind of wanted more than just shouldreds at four and you wanted to have a four every time especially in the black red deck and so Something like this, where you have, you know, kind of you're looking for your fifth, but it makes more sense to pair it off as a three and a two. That can be another room where you're going to play two ofs as well. A thing that often jumps out to me as well, one last little point on two ofs, is we're seeing it a lot more now from players because of things like Preordain uh, entering modern, right? And that's like a 
to Abe's point of dig through time, that's like, you know, the closest thing we sort of have to that right now in modern that's playable. And it changes what it is. But typically, two ofs are also sometimes cards that you don't want early, you want late, right? If you listen to all of our examples, Crocs is a card you kind of want in the, the mid to late game, right? Brave is sort of the last spell you want to cast. Children and Archmane of Dross are four drops, which, you know, are later, but are still, you know, they're not saying you're trying to play on turn one. And when we are talking about things that are kind of playing them early, I mean, that's sort of being the extra copies, like five and six, like we're seeing with Pelucranos being, you know, we talked about it being a three of, but some people do play as a two of where it's supplementing Old Growth Troll. And in that spot, it's sometimes a little worse at doing it if you need to have it. But in this case, it's just redundancy, right? So you're never really needing it early when it's like a unique specific thing. That's sort of why two of sort of don't happen a lot, right? Because they're sort of either late game stuff or a redundancy thing. Very rarely is that something that you have to have early and promptly. Otherwise, it would be a higher number. And Abe, what about one ofs? Yeah, one ofs kind of are the biggest category. I, I think there's like the obviously there's a bunch of reasons you want to play one copy of a card. Some of them are obvious. You know, sometimes you just want to be able to tutor for the card if you have like you know a green sun zenith deck. You're probably gonna play one of a bunch of your like bullet creatures that you can go tutor for. You know, if you have like a, you know, in Yogmoth, your Court of Calling deck, you have a bunch of different pieces that you might want for um for the same reasons. So you have a bunch of one of creatures that are all all good enough to draw individually, but you know, having access to the right one at the right time and making it so you virtually through these tutors have five copies of the card or more is really, really pivotal. And that's just like one portion of it. There's a lot of times where you know, much like we were saying in three ofs, you play that one of a braid or that one of of like a, a flexed card, like a, a dread boar or something in your red black deck to have more coverage where it plays into one of these packages. But also sometimes, and I, I know that we've both done this many times, Mason, I think talked about it on the show too, in building your, your full complete 75, sometimes it just makes sense to pull a card from your sideboard that's in the realm of your main deck some removal spell maybe to, to make room to have that extra sideboard card for a matchup that matters to you you wind up playing one of those in your main deck kind of to complete that three one split or that you know three one one split or four one split of like five copies like for a while even in hammer like core outfitter was a one of you played or maybe even two of you played depending on the week because you just wanted more pure steel paladins but you can't play more than four so there's a lot of times where one ofs are really either supported or supporting some sort of tutor package, or they are adding on that redundancy for very specific, like linchpin things, where four is just not enough copies of that effect, right? You really want five or six or, you know, nine or 10. Um, and so you you dig deep on that. Or, I mean, more classically, things like an Aetherling. You know, you're, you're, one of, you're one of kill condition and some big, slow blue-white deck. You're one of approach to the second sun. That's the other kind of kind of one of there really is. There's there's either it's part of a you know a bigger package of cards that are actually in your deck, or it can really be something that's carrying the 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 weight of your entire game plan or anything in between, right? Sometimes you just have a one of that is a good role player, especially in more mid-rangey decks and the more value-based formats. Sometimes you just have room to play some cards that are, you know, well positioned miscellaneous value cards, and that's that's where you'll see kind of one of that don't fall into those two categories. And overall, when you see a one of, uh, especially when you're looking at a deck list, I would say the number one thing to do is ask yourself, why is this card here? What is it doing? And, you know, nine times out of 10, there's a good answer. And that's why you should feel about the one of that you play. It should really make sense why it's there. And the, the reason it's going to come up should be apparent because, like, I mean, even going back to a standard format that maybe not a lot of people remember these days, but the Bant Company standard format, a lot of people played like one or two Archangel apps. And it kind of, obviously that card was very good, but did it really make sense? So you're a collect company deck, you know, is this supposed to be more companies? And it was like, no, it actually was this great trump in the mirrors in the game ones to have something like this that couldn't be spell quellered and you know, really dominated the board and you could work with yourself with spirits to flip and kind of have a one-sided wrath or a wrath that you controlled. And so having access to that first copy changed a lot and 
that's the kind of high impact you want out of a one of in most of your deck. So I don't know if you have anything to add there, Mason, but that's no. that's kind of how I think about one ofs. Is there should really be a, a perfect reason in your mind as to why it's worth playing this copy of the card if it's not on game plan. I only have one small thing that I love everything you said. There are sometimes the the last rare one of that we're seeing modern design sort of push on us a lot is hey, I'm really tempting and I'm bad in multiples. So like Bo Seju is actually a, a, maybe the worst example of the five because it's the strongest, but Sokinzan, Takanuma, right? Odawara, we're seeing a lot of this where it's like, hey, I have some utility. I sort of cost you a little in some nebulous way, but I you know don't really want multiple of me because it can be really bad. I think before those, maybe a better example was like, Jawari's Disruption or Seagate Restoration, where we would see some players play one of those in Narset Blue White decks in Pioneer, where it's just like, oh, I want a land I can find off a of Narset, right? And I want to have another land for my land count, but I also kind of want to have some spell that maybe does something so it's like worth having a tap land or a land that might cost you three life, because in four or five percent of games, it does actually convert into a real spell and you don't need the land. And decks that sort of do that sort of thing come up a fair amount as well. Sort of writing this sort of new age design thing of trying to incentivize people to get more one ofs in their deck because it's more fun that way. Yeah, and, and I also think that really something that is pivotal to this topic these days is that more and more so cards are getting more complicated in a way that's wide. When you're building a deck, each of your cards can do multiple things, especially when it comes to like, right, even as you're just speaking to multi- Modal d- uh, double face cards. Yeah, m- modal double face car- cards, and especially the land ones. They start asking you a question of how many spells or lands, what's your consideration there, and you start to be able to blur the lines and flexibility even more within deck building. And, you know, I think it's important to kind of understand when you're looking at someone's deck list, what is it that they're thinking about? And what is it that you're thinking about with how you're how you're doing that and being very intentional about the numbers that you're choosing so that right you're building better decks or you're you know tuning your decks to be better with that in mind because it it is more and more often that so many cards are so good at doing so many of the same things that understanding the nuance or you know how you want your deck to use them uh really changes and and that reflects into the numbers of how many of these cards you play because ultimately you're trying to build a deck that's going to see the cards it needs to win every game and have that amount and the right number based on how many cards you're seeing. Uh, we could. There's a whole episode here also that could be just going into the math of why these numbers are this way. I will say that if you're interested in that, I know that there's a lot of writing. I think Frank Carson did most of it about like hypergeometric distributions, all these things that don't really transfer well into an audio podcast to talk about a lot of numbers and math, but there is a lot out there that can really explain a lot of the why behind these rules of thumb and these heuristics. And I would definitely encourage anyone, you know, who really wants to hammer home for themselves what that, you know, what, what this means to, to go and seek that out and really understand kind of the differences on, on that level. Cause it will uh, undoubtedly make you a better, a better deck builder and a better, better tuner when it comes to it. Yeah. I agree with that hundred percent. I had this come up in the last week where Built my scam deck for Apex, put a four of season pyromancer on main deck, and then I was like, well, I don't need my utility land. I can play Agnames Awakening, right? It's a land. Also, it's a good utility with Pyromancer. I'm bringing back cards I discarded. I'm going to make all my land drops with Pyromancer where you don't do a Fable, right? It pitches to grief. All these little factors, understanding that really had ramifications on my entire deck and sort of the way I had to build it. And so understanding these rules and, you know, uh, that deck has two and three of as well I could get into. But regardless, it really helps and lets you get a good idea of what's going off your deck and really build the best deck. And this is why sometimes you see decks that look kind of wild from certain deck builders early on. They have plans and they have ideas. And sometimes the hive mind sort of, you know, greases them down to their central core. But there were plans there, right? And sometimes that has to change. Sometimes it's for the worse. But this episode hopefully helps you with that. I know this is a topic that is really nebulous and hard to understand. And I'm sure when you first started, someone gave you the TLDR sort of meh version of this episode. But hopefully really going into detail and having this tight scripted episode was helpful for you. Let us know if you like this more 
you know, we sort of worked and got this down to a thing where it's like we had it planned out. And we hope that you all like this sort of episode. It was a very different thing for CC. That's going to do it for our main topic, Abe. But we still have the Patreon question. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, it will always be free. But Patreon gives you a lot of perks. One of them is you get to ask a question that's brought up at the end of the show. And I'm going to leave this person anonymous. They didn't make themselves anonymous, but I feel like there's some intent with that maybe. They said, I've been trying to discuss with my local friend group more about magic. I've been hesitant, though, in the past because I read back what I wrote and realized it sounded kind of harsh. So my question to you is, how do I start reasonable magic discourse without dismissing anyone's opinion or coming off obtuse and disrespectful? Uh, I'm going to sort of take the lead here really quick, Gabe, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. And I'll sort of use our relationship and our relationship with our good friend and you know friend of the show, Misplaced Ginger, as well, <laughs> where... We sometimes all disagree on stuff, but there's a baseline understanding, first, of respect, I think, between all three of us for our skill and magic and our opinions, you know. Abe and Ginger and I sometimes differ in different spots where, like, you know, two of us might agree with one and not the other. But there's still respect there. And also, we're friends, you know, first, magic players second. And so we sort of understand that, like... Just because Miss by Ginger might think it's stupid to not play, you know, Rakdos and to play stock green if you're a strong player, just love your skill, whatever. Abe and I disagree for like lots of reasons, right? Uh, and we play a lot of what's it, Abe? Stock green, baby. Stock green, baby. Best deck, best deck. Anyways, that comes in and it isn't personal where it's not like no one's feelings get hurt, right? It's different than that. We're trying to figure out some sort of puzzle. And I think often what happens is some players feel like when you disagree with them, you're maybe insulting their intelligence or insulting them or, you know, trying to belittle them. And you are not your like magic opinions. Right. And just because you disagree or maybe are wrong or maybe they're wrong doesn't, you know, shouldn't, I, in my opinion, create a lot of stress and tension. It can in some groups. And I am sorry that that happens. I would just remind those people if they, if you feel like they're starting to get defensive or they're uh, standoffish to remind them like, Hey, I'm sorry if I came off in a way that made you feel this way. 100% not my intent. I'm just really interested in having this conversation with you. If I thought you were dumb, I wouldn't have this conversation. I'm sorry. Can we get back on track? Yeah, I think all of that's really, really good advice. Something that I think happens to a lot of people and a lot of groups of magic players that can kind of make it hard. And, and it's really just hard to like talk about the nuance of these things in general without, especially when it's your opinion and your right your held belief about you know tournament magic and we're all i mean for the most part a lot of people listen to the show i bet you're a little bit competitive and i bet you like to you know you, you feel like the things you're doing are are the right things most of the time is to remind yourself that even at worlds i guarantee you there will be all of the best players in the world this year and none of them will agree you know like groups of them will have worked really hard to agree on some things, but they will not all agree with each other. And that really is an important thing to remember, even as it trickles down to your playgroups locally, is that you're going to be surrounded by people who have thoughts and opinions that are going to disagree with your own. And it's not really about, I feel like so often we, we tell ourselves it's about getting it right or being absolutely correct and having like, you know, the best opinion, but really the best thing you can do when you're talking with anyone about magic or really trying to understand anyone's perspective is just that you're trying to understand the thought process that led them to what their determination was. And if you don't think that that thought process was, you know, correct or productive, just don't follow their lead, you know, but you don't have to be right to learn from someone and you don't have to even be right to get value out of like you can be wrong and get a ton of value. In fact, I get the most value out of conversations I have when I'm wrong, because then I see a perspective that maybe leads me more towards the truth. So I would just focus on, you know, not introducing, you know, or presenting your opinion as if it has to be taken as right, right? You're not debating them. You don't have to win other people's buy-in for them to listen to you, for you to be, have your opinion be valid, because ultimately, what's that saying, Mason? Ball don't lie. You'll go out um, there, and if you're right, you'll go out there, you'll play stock green, you'll qualify for a PT. That, that's a little bit of dig at Ginger until you realize that Ginger just top eights every RC in Canada. Yeah, so, and fight every yeah, I can't, I can't really. <laughs> if anything, that was a dig at you for playing Phoenix. But I'll say this. I think Corey Baumeister, myself, and like 
two other people were the only ones playing green at this Apex event. Fifty percent conversion rate, baby. Best deck. It's really good. But 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 to my point, you know, ultimately what's gonna kind of tell the tale over time of whether or not what you're doing is, you know, strong or you know, whether or not your opinions and your beliefs are founded in reality is gonna be, you know, those conversations that you have and then the results you put up and then the results you see when you're out playing. And when it comes to, you know, either, hey, what would you do in this spot? You know, talk me through why you would make this play, where you can have that discussion without it being, I think that's the wrong thing to do. It can be, oh, have you considered, like, I thought about that play, but I maybe thought of doing something else because I'm thinking about this too, right? Like, I'm thinking about what if they have this card in their hand, you know? What if they draw this? All of these things are worth considering, and talking through them with someone else is going to give you a lot of value and added perspective. So focus on the subject matter you're talking about. Don't focus on the outcome. Don't focus on on being right or anything. And I think that you'll find that the way you come across is a lot less. But when you depersonalize yourself from the things you're saying, and this is just a general rule, like I, part of my job is to communicate very effectively with many, many different people from many walks of life. So I've tried really hard to get good at this and thought a lot about it. Part of what I do on a daily basis is to depersonalize both you and the other party from the thing you're talking about and just let it sit as the topic of, of discussion and remove that, that personal attachment to it. Because that'll make it a lot easier to avoid doing something like coming off as harsh or dismissive because really you're just trying to talk to the objectivity of, of the thing you're talking about. So. I would say to try to do that and just remember that there's always something to learn from everyone, even if it's, you know, just a different way of talking through the same way that you thought about something. It, it can be so valuable and try to get that value more than anything. The other way to get on the show is to leave a YouTube comment or question to get on here. And we had, so there I was playing the energy 10 K and Dom Harvey was sitting across from the dude next to me, I almost died. I'm glad someone got to meet Dom. We loved having Dom on the show. You know, good friend, really excited to see how he does at Worlds. I'm excited to see where his conclusions come, Abe. And it was, you know, really great to have him on last week. And I hope people enjoyed it. It seems like they did. Along those lines of really quick sort of, you know, meeting people interacting. When I was at the Apex event, Abe, two listeners of the show uh, both made the finals of the ReCQ. Robin ended up winning hers, playing Modern, playing Scam, best deck in that format. And then Dustin ended up actually losing in the finals, playing Stock Green Baby. But Abe, he beat two Spirits players on the way to it and didn't tilt, wasn't complaining, was happy and just sort of focused on what he needed to do to win those games, took his time. Ended up losing to the other green player, but still a great run and sort of, you know, had this, you know, the deck stacked against them, but didn't give up. So I wanted to give a shout out to both those people and say, you know, it's great if you see us events, come and say hi. That's awesome. I love to hear about listeners winning. Mm-hmm. That's the best. Heck yeah. Uh, and the best part is I beat Dustin's brother, who beat you at the RC. I beat him in the win-in for Modern, you know, so it's just all dubs everywhere for that whole family. With that, though, you can join the conversation by going to Twitter.com. Don't worry, it'll look like an X site when you join, but it's safe for you to use. Uh, you can go there. You can also go to Patreon, like we had mentioned before, and then you can join our community Discord there. There's a public Discord as well. You can go to the YouTube comment section. It's a great way to help us with the algorithm, sort of push it to new players. And you can also review, uh, like, and subscribe. That helps us a bunch. And there's the rest of the network as well with the drafting archetypes by Sam Black. That show is going to start doing its new set stuff here soon, Abe, as I believe tomorrow is the starts of Wild of Eldraine at the time of our recording. So new set already. How exciting. Abe, if someone wants to find you, where can they go to find you? They can find me over at twitter.com slash more nothings. Still DM me for coaching or email me at more nothings at gmail.com. If you're looking for for coaching, that, that's where you find me these days. Uh, that's that's most of it. Oh, and you can find me uh, occasionally in the booth with uh, one handsome, tall Apex Open champion, uh, Mason Clark on the NRB series. Uh, so here's the question I have for you, Abe, when it comes to NRG. Because you know I'm repping. We work for NRG. You know, they're you know Apex NRG is one of those things where you know we're, they're all living in the same world, trying to compete. Should I have pulled the NRG jersey out only for the finals? Because I had it in the bag. And thought about putting on like the champs jacket just for the finals, but I decided against it. I thought it would be a rude guest move. Would it have been? I rude? think it would be a bit of a rude guest move. All I gotta say 
on this topic though before we move on to you plugging your stuff mm-hmm. is that Todd seemed a little tired this weekend and maybe maybe he's a little overworked maybe they could use a second pair do some coverage I can remote in you know mm. you can work it out <laughs> uh, why don't you drive in like I had ooh, <laughs> ooh many reasons mm. but uh you know maybe maybe, maybe we'll maybe we can work it out maybe maybe I can drive in you can always fly here and then ride seven hours with me or, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We'll see what happens. But of course, yeah, jokes aside, it was great to have me there. And, you know, maybe they can have Ape sometime too, or maybe Spencer as well. We'll have to see what can go on. But yeah, you can find me over at twitter.com at Mason E. Clark. You can find me at twitch.tv slash the Mason Clark. You can find me each and every week at Card Kingdom, where I'm writing articles. This week, I am getting y'all prepared for the RCQ season that starts in just two weeks, Abe. We're going to have modern RCQ season. So get excited for that. Maybe you can brush off those hammers and we can get down to business. And you can find me uh, in Durham, North Carolina. At the weekend of this show is coming out, I'm doing the Extra Life Charity Tournament there. And I think I'm going to be back at Apex on September 9th as well. Uh, my local judge friend is has judging it, so I might hop in his car. So you can find me in all of those places. And hopefully the feedback I got that when I get to the shout out portion, I say it a little too quickly uh was adequately adjusted for this week gave a little always improving moment for me was you know got some feedback that's like i want to find it but sometimes you talk so fast i can't hear and just trying to adjust for that so there you go abe what did you learn on the show this week i learned mason that you have only made one mistake in an apex tournament in your life no i made i made one big mistake i made a couple i made a couple small mistakes as well like in the thing before. I also forgot Chainville costs four man to activate after playing Magic for like 16 hours in a row, 18 matches or whatever on like five hours of sleep. And I did all the math and you can see it in the gruel when I rip the top deck and I almost throw the thing. And then I'm like, oh, wait, it costs four. And I was like, uh, play Cavalier. I didn't get three mana from Nick though. So, oh God, it's so awful. <laughs> but what I learned this week, Abe, is that you trusted me when I said I only had one a uh, huge mistake or whatever at the beginning of the show. It wasn't just for dramatic effect. And I will honor that trust. I think it's really fascinating the way that being tired affects us differently. Mm-hmm. Because for me, being like tired from long stints of play, like knowing what the cards do or how much mana they like all those things are just burned into me, into my muscle memory. Like I just mm-hmm. like, I know. But it sounds like you just, does that, does that really like, you're like, hmm, what my chain veil do? I mean, I double check like most of the stuff. I just don't practice green. I've played green three times. Like I played green at the 5K that I can see it to my friend in, right? Which they got wrong this around coverage, but whatever, it's fine. Uh, I basically won it. I, I would have won the matchup was great. Then I won an RCQ and then I won the Apex event. And I don't play green on Modo because it's awful. And I already know green's great. So I test other things. Sometimes I'm the villain. But Abe, I'm on like match 30 of green, maybe. Actually, probably less. It was... 9 plus 12, and then draw. Honestly, Abe, I'm probably on match 28 playing green all time or whatever. Let's see. Where am I at? I think I'm mm, on I've played a couple of local events, to be fair. So I'm probably more in like the 40 range now that I'm thinking about it, but I don't really count those. Um, we might be in the same. The same I'm definitely well under 100. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I didn't think you'd be, I, I would have guessed you were in the 60 range, to be honest. I'll say this. Maybe I did I, play some RCQs. I thought about green a lot. And when I like, because the, another thing to remember is the 5k I won with green, Abe, it was almost a year ago to the date. It's like the end of August. It's like the August 20th. Green's here forever, dude. Yeah. It's awesome. here forever. <laughs> well, that's awful. But at that point I had just <laughs> written an article on a uh, mono green and I had done the combo. And so when I did that one, I just like, I had it all ingrained really easily, right? And even though I had played back to back tournaments, because I, I actually won the 10K the day before that tournament. So I won the 10K, then I conceded the finals of the 5K. And so I was tired there too, but I like knew it all. And then this one, I just said like, Friday, I stayed up until 3 a.m. hanging out with people and like doing stuff. And then Saturday, I did the same thing. And then, you know, it was just like, I had played a ton of magic. And I was just like so tired and the spot was so hard and it wasn't deterministic either. I didn't have the Kiora. So I was having to find it as well. But I thought I had oh, everything. You're surfing. Yeah, I, I yeah, I was freestyling a little bit, but I thought I had figured out a way to get it all to work out if I had found the once I found the Kiora, and then that's when the problem started arising. 
was I had like not done it in forever. And when I played <laughs> when I played the RCQ I won Abe, I reread my own article on how to do the combo math because I had forgotten what the numbers were. But that's not true. I was pretty sure I knew what the numbers were, but I was like anxious enough to reread what I had wrote. And I was like, okay, that's what it was. Cool. And so, you know, I check in on that sort of thing and then it just don't have it built in, you know, and coaching, no one ever asks you like, what is it? And when they do, I just, it's 11, but it's like, you know, I don't know in the moment, I don't want to like trust my gut like that. And I have a whole article. I can just link them. So I'm again, really open and honest here at the end of the show. We'll see how much this actually makes the recording. I think it will make it. This episode was short. We got to pad it a little, but yeah, I don't know, man. I get, yeah, I, I, just... I get a little anxious. Like, I will say this: if you watch, if you watch the top eight, I slow roll the the filigree silex against Corey because I knew that they were switching over to us on the camera, and I wasn't sure because the other match ended. And sometimes they're slow to switch, and I didn't want them to miss the blowout. So I like him and Haw for a second, even though I knew I could play silex untapped with Kiora and Pop, and I knew his card in hand wasn't Boseju because he had like grabbed it with a card earlier. So <laughs> I, I knew he was dead, but I was like, I gotta wait a second for the razzle dazzle. <laughs> Oh, I mean that's how you that's how you grow the game. That's good yeah. for coverage. That's good for magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was awesome. It was great. I got Bo Matt up with the free little Ollie Oop where he gets to you know be like, oh, Mason's gonna do this. You know, it's great. It was awesome times. But that is gonna do it for this week's episode of Constructor Criticism. We'll see you all next week for another episode of CC MTG.